So I'm going to go ahead and switch now to show you guys uh, some of the, uh, the app. I'm going to pop the audio here as well. Oh, cool. Good sound? Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and just give you a little bit of a tour of how all this stuff actually works together. So you can hear sound. Um, basically, every time I tap to advance, the content's going to reformat itself, and the music's going to change ever so slightly. So it doesn't actually, you can actually go forward and backwards. And so it creates this really kind of magical experience where what you're trying to do is make sure the content is sort of dynamically recomposing itself every time you advance the story. And so when two panels are on the page, I want to make sure that you're focusing on the next piece of the content. Right? This panel comes up from the bottom because the motion of that panel is sort of uh, bottom to top, and then the next panel comes in right to left. And so every page sort of had a dedicated um, animation approach to making it work correctly. So this is the scene between Mosaddegh and the Shah. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the actual story of Operation Ajax. Um, but this is a, sort of a showdown between these two men. But I want you to pay attention to both the sound and the motion as I kind of just sort of gradually tap through this. <coughs> it's ever so subtle. Every time you tap, you want to get a little bit of a payoff. Ever so, ever so slight. So this is one of my one of the most interesting pages to me in terms of what you can do with a dynamic composition. So you can kind of turn stuff on and off as you proceed through the story. So you get a little bit of an audio cue there, and then it sort of leads you into the next panel. So there's all sorts of different ways to play with language of film, but actually maintaining a reading experience the entire time. Because at any moment when this thing pauses, you're actually just reading um, basically a dynamically changing comic composition. Also watch the, pa the paper here as I exit the page. I see how they rotate ever so slightly. So this whole world is actually built in 3D, and I'll talk more about that towards the end. Um, but it's Unity driving this entire experience. So for me, one of the things I got to play with as a creative director is how to create an animation system and an experience that actually honors this, uh, the, the reading of comics. Um, there's another side to this whole thing. It's a historically accurate story. And we wanted to layer in information in a way that made uh, you know, the story come alive and be uh, sort of impactful as, a, as an actual historical story. And so occasionally while you're reading, you'll see uh, stars appear that allow you to pull up additional information. And so here you can actually look at this document and actually like, navigate it on the page. Um, you know, and we, have, we didn't want to overload the reader with like, stars on every page. There's a real challenge to find a balance. Um, but if you want more information about key moments, you can actually dig down and go deeper. I'm going to fast forward to uh, um, a couple of other pages here, just because there's some really cool moments in the story. Uh, this is one of my favorite pages in terms of animation. This is Ayatollah Kashani uh, rallying up a crowd of uh, upset Iranian citizens, trying to get uh, most of them back in power. The Royal Guardsmen show up, and this guy is ordered to shoot on them, and he refuses and takes off his uniform. And I see a. So there's a lot of uh, cinematic impact, right? And I think that was really what I was going for, is trying to reach. Uh, this, you know, leveraging motion, leveraging sound, and doing it in a way that really, uh, you know, still still has you reading, still giving your energy and your attention to this thing, <laughs> but in a way we're getting a really big payoff and making it more uh, impactful. Uh, I'm going to go to another section now. Um, so one of the uh, challenges we had with this is we had a lot of supplemental content um, that we didn't know we were going to actually end up being able to use in the final product. We had video footage, we had actual documents, we had photos, and the, the real challenge for me was like, okay, cool, we're on the iPad now, we can actually embed this stuff. How do we do that? 
And what I came up with was a sort of like way to integrate um, the narrator, who's historically fictitious, and uh, use him as a vehicle for delivering the truth of all these other characters. Uh, when you're telling something that's historically accurate, uh, there's a lot of sensitivity there. It's one of the reasons why the script took so long to produce. Um, you're finding a balance every day between uh, telling the truth and making it exciting, and it's always a struggle between the two because sometimes the truth can be really boring. And so uh, what we did is we took the, the historically fictitious narrator and we made him sort of an old man, uh, sort of reflecting on his past as one of the young agents in this, uh, this operation. And we have him sort of looking through these files at the very beginning of the book. And what I did is I actually made this another part of the app. You can actually go and you can explore these files as a supplemental section. And so this is going to be sideways. I apologize. I'll just try to work my way through it. Um, but there's these dossiers on each of the characters, right? And so you can actually, as if you were in the first person of the main character looking through them, I'll just do, there, is that better? There we go. Um, but you could actually like explore these, and it's all multi-touch. You can like start to play with it. You can also get all OCD, kind of like the um, But you know, we actually wrote up these, uh, these dossiers on them. And this is my hope is that by providing just another drill down level of information, it'll make people curious, and it'll reinforce the fact that what you're reading is actually a true story. And it'll help delineate between what's historically, you know, hard and fast fact and what's our, you know, slight dramatization to try to make the whole thing flow and work. And I think that's a real challenge uh, when it comes to telling history. It's so sensitive. It can be such a divisive uh, thing. Um, the other thing that was really cool about this is we have um, actual declassified CIA documents. Um, the story of Operation Ajax is pretty well documented. Um, I had the coffee stain because they were very ugly. So, uh, But this is the, uh, the actual coup plan that was uh, declassified under the Freedom of Information Act. And so now I can integrate that right into the app in a really slick way that allows you to, you know, feel like you're discovering the actual uh, truth. And I think that when it comes to education and really getting people aware of this stuff, um, it's a really powerful way to sort of build lore in a, in a you know, in very engaging new format. Um, and then the last part that I think is the coolest is we actually have uh, newsreel footage. And these will be sideways too, but... Um, actually, I'll just view these in the comic, just because it's more interesting, uh, instead of playing them sideways. So I'll go to the last chapter and I'll show you one of my, uh, uh, one of the sort of darkest, most interesting parts. Oh, I know where I'm going to go. Yeah, let me go to the chapter. Uh, I'll show you Eisenhower getting elected. Oops. I can figure out which, uh, uh, chapter five. Here we go, chapter six. We have this montage on the Red Scare. And the real challenge for me was where to add newsreel footage. Again, you don't want like video footage on every page, and we were sort of at the, uh, at the mercy of what we could find off the internet and license. And so uh, it kind of became this like challenge at the end to kind of fit it all together. And this is really cool. This is sort of talking about the, the backdrop to what was going on in America in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, uh, the rise of the Cold War. And so we use that sort of a montage experience to talk about this, and you can blend it. You know, imagery all over the place, and lots of cool, uh, you know, uh, effects and noise and stuff. Tyler kind of indulged that one a bit. That was, <laughs> but it sort of ends with this. But it did have one real effect, right? In terms of uh, what this all meant. It was election year in America, and Andre Stevenson, former governor of Illinois, became the standard bearer of an enthusiastic Democratic Party at its Chicago convention. A short time later, the Republican convention met at San Francisco and made short work of its nomination. Their choice by acclamation was... Watch as an hour at the end of this. It's really cool. As returns rolled in on election night, the result was never in doubt. It was a landslide for the Eisenhower-Nixon ticket and America's resounding vote of confidence in its leader. There it is. <laughs> so now when you go to the next page, right, we have them all kind of bizarre. I thought it was really cool. It kind of all blends together. That's like... Anyway, so you get the idea. So I'm going to go back to the laptop now. So, I don't know if I still need sound, but I'll just throw this in anyway. Cool. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of other aspects of the app. Um, so, I came up with this dynamic composition to arrange the panels in a really cool way. Uh, at first, we weren't sure what tool we were going to use for that, um, because we knew that Flash wasn't going to work on iOS devices. And back in 2010, there was like, what tool do we use? I mean, you know, you need a multi-timeline editor to do this kind of stuff. Um, if any of you guys work in motion graphics or interactivity in general, which you probably all do, right? Um, you're going to know that that just doesn't work. And so uh, we tried to use Maya at first, thinking that maybe we'll be able to export the data, and that's going to work. And 
is terrible. Maya doesn't have a multi-timeline editor, and it doesn't do all these other things uh, you know, in real time very well. Um, primarily, we need to translate, rotate, scale, alpha, and tint. And so I actually ended up using Flash to mock up the very first uh, chapter because I needed to do a lot of creative exploration. And so I think the lesson from that is that sometimes you just don't have the right tool at the right time, so just go play and figure it out, and you'll be able to catch up later. This is a photo Photoshop mock-up of what my pre-planning looks like when it comes to planning out some of this animation. And so what I do is I give this to my animators, and they're able to uh, go off of this. This is sort of a beat-by-beat -beat flow through Photoshop of me just taking the print comics and breaking them up into these compositions. And you know, the most minimal direction to show how that stuff slides off. And so that page is interesting because it actually has two scenes on it. And I'm like, well, why not just leverage that? We can infinitely lay out the content however we want now, because there's no limitations. It's not like we have to print more pages. And so this is what that composition sort of became uh, later in the book after um, being flowed through Photoshop. Uh, a note on sound, right? It's a reading experience first and foremost. And uh, you want just enough sound to fill in the gaps. You, know, you don't ever want to go silent unless you want to make a dramatic point. And you want to figure out when to use room tone, when to use music, when to use sound effects. And what I found at the end of the day is that you just need enough audio to make it work. And I think that um, you know, the guy who was working with us came from a film background. And it's really tempting to want to keep pushing it more and more. Um, but again, it's the art of restraint. It's really about just enough to make it work. And, um, and that's actually beneficial because it also makes it less expensive and faster to, uh, to create. Uh, the value of user experience. Um, so we had kind of ignored this for a really long time, and it really hurt <laughs> first time around. We had spent all of our energy on making the story awesome and making sure the art looked great and making sure the interactivity was really, uh, was really cool, but we didn't really focus on how people were going to access this as a piece of software. Um, and you know, all you have to do is use your test once. I'm sure this is like, obvious to a lot of people, but um, when you're making anything interactive, you've got to be accounting for the fact that it's going to be on a device that doesn't have buttons and trying to get people used to turning the page and all this other stuff. I think it's better now, um, but it really took a while to make that work. Um, when I think about uh, you know, sort of the layers of, of how people access an experience like this, you know, the core of it is a story. If you don't have a good story, what's the point of all the other things, right? You need a good story, then you need a good presentation, so all the art and sound and animation and whatnot. Um, and then on top of that, of course, is the interface. So you're basically creating an awesome UX to provide a great presentation to what ultimately should be a great story. If the story is weak, it's not going to really add any value to, uh, to what you're doing. Um, enhanced content, the black hole of the ebook. <laughs> I think this has been discussed a lot. Uh, the question is how do you add content to a book and enhance it when you can add infinite content? Uh, it becomes a really dicey proposition because you, temptation is to just dump everything in there. And learning where to draw the line is really hard. Um, you can layer in books within books within books within films within, et cetera. So um, you know, I just showed you guys sort of the technique in the desktop. Really figuring out where to draw the line to make people curious but not give them the whole story um, is important. And I think the reason that that's important is because at the end of the day, what you want them to do is become curious. You want them to actually go pick up Stephen Kinzer's book or go watch a documentary or go on Wikipedia or find all these other sources that document this stuff. And so, um, basically, I call it the power of tangential learning. And to me, what that means is it's a tune drill down. It's something that's going to make you, you know, just get curious enough to want to go one level deeper. Um, it kind of looks like this, right? So, um, at the core experience is the comic, which means that if all you're going to do is read the comic, um, you need to make sure that that's a complete experience. And it gives you all the information you need so that if that's all you do, you're going to know who the people were and what the times and dates were. We had to go back and edit things to make sure that, uh, you know, People were calling each other by names a little more often than not so that you knew who they were and things like that. And then the curiosity takes you one level deeper and you're going to pull up a, a document or, or a, a, a reel. And then from that, hopefully you'll want to actually go off and, and start digging around on your own. Um, it's like drinking from a fire hose. If you just give everybody all the information at once, they're going to, they're going to tune out. So um, I think that's really important for building that stuff in the future. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, you guys uh, may not be able to tell, but Ajax is actually built in Unity. Uh, it's actually a game engine under the hood, driving the entire experience. It's all real-time 3D. We didn't really get a chance to explore that because we were so busy just trying to get this thing done with basic, you know, flat animation, which I think is still pretty profound. But there's a lot of room for experimentation here, right? What does it mean when a game engine is driving a comic book? Well, there's a lot of opportunity to explore, and I'm looking forward to digging into that soon. Um, but in terms of just the larger idea of what our media is doing, I mean, the app space is now intersecting with your television in your living room, right? And so it makes me wonder, you know, as we transition out of this sort of handheld modality to a space where, you know, you suddenly have big budget console games existing, 
what's that overlap going to look like? What does it mean when our experiences can be built in a game engine? You know, basically, we're now seeing AirPlay allow us to connect our mobile devices to our TVs and the whole living room uh, ecosystem is changing in reaction to this. And um, I don't know, it's both terrifying and exciting. Uh, one of the reasons why I find it personally terrifying is that there's some pretty extreme barriers here, at least for us. Um, as you guys know, the App Store is typically a 99 cent or a freemium experience. And we should really be an EPUB or a book. If this was a printed uh, book, it would be a $20 commodity, right? And there would be a tangible analog uh, thing to compare it to. Um, but EPUB doesn't support crazy technology. It doesn't support game engines and all the bells and whistles. And so we're at a bit of a disconnect uh, in terms of consumer expectation right now, in terms of how people value this stuff. And so all the other people experimenting and pioneering, they're awesome. We're all kind of like taking one for the, for the team, so to speak, because it's gonna, I think this stuff is eventually going to be very successful, but um, we need support from Apple, and we need support from Android, and we need um, you know, an ability to market our content correctly. Uh, the flip side to all of this is that you also have the console era, right? The iPad 3 just got announced. It's got crazy 3D capabilities, and it can probably rival the consoles or start to. And, you know, that uh, ecosystem of games is a $60 experience, and it's siloed, right? Not everybody can publish there. <clears throat> so it makes me wonder what's going to happen when all these things start to converge. You know, as people say, they don't really want uh, in-app purchases in their console games. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... <laughs> So on a recap, uh, incorporating the lessons of Stradivarius, uh, you know, if we hadn't made a traditional comic book first, uh, we never would have, thank you, uh, we never would have been able to make a successful digital experience, I don't think. And again, the question for all of you guys that I have is how do we, how do we maintain the value of these like, beautiful traditions you know, of the past as we go forward and pioneer the future? Um, I just want to add that we're working with, uh, with BoomGen, I'm really excited about that, to really turn this into um, you know, a game, and an educational resource. And so if anybody has any questions about the stuff, um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you after. But uh, if you want to come to the mics, that's basically it. Uh, we're 40 minutes, 42. So thanks so much.